Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Public Goods Podcast. Today, we have Shadman Hussein, which is not only one of my friends in this space, but like a big brother to me in blockchain. We've uh, done a lot of uh, Web3 things together. Um, and this is a very interesting and unique perspective as opposed to other episodes. Before, we've had people building funding mechanisms, people building DAOs. Um, and honestly, it's a little bit about uh, intersection of a lot of these worlds, but very unique in a sense that uh, Shadman has unique expertise in not only working with the private sector, but also working with the public sector, with the government who is a steward of many of the public goods in the traditional space that we know and love, like our roads and, you know, a public goods funding mechanism like our taxes. And so, um, yeah, there's a lot of parallels we can draw to what we're doing at Web3 and a very unique uh, perspective that we can learn from Shabbat. So welcome, Ramadan Mubarak. Ramadan Mubarak, glad to be here. And yeah, I first wanted to start, I know your journey has kind of been long. Just tell people how you got in to the Web3 and the crypto space and how that evolution came along um, your career. Sure. I mean, so, you know, I'm a big believer in signs and signs from God. And I had three, three specific chances to get into Web3. The first one was I had a high school friend who sent me Bitcoin back in 2011. And um, I didn't pay much attention to it. And I thought, okay, this is weird. And I had it in my laptop, which I don't have anymore. And I don't even want to think about how much Bitcoin I had uh, at that point, because I'm probably going to get depressed if I really think about how much Bitcoin I received in 2011. The second time was in 2013, when I saw a news article about um, some guy mining Bitcoin on his laptop and his girlfriend becoming, getting mad at him because his laptop was getting hot. And he threw it out and that became worth millions of dollars. And people are still looking for that Bitcoin in the trash. And the third time was in college in when my cybersecurity professor talked about the dark web and how 90% of the web is the dark web and we are only exposed to 10%. And later that night, I go onto the dark web with my curious mind to see Bitcoin for the third time being used for transactions. And that is when I realized the importance and I started taking Bitcoin seriously. And I saw the the implications after reading the white paper. And I went down the rabbit hole of blockchain, the technology itself. And then I discovered Ethereum and understood the power of smart contracts and how any application we see today can be built on smart contracts and in a new way that will redefine and reshape the way we live. So that's sort of my journey. And, you know, it took me three times to really pay attention, but I haven't looked back since um, going down that rabbit hole. And then I started um, Blockchain at Mason, a club at at my university, because there was a big lack of education from my university and professors at the time, you know, in 2015, 2016, nobody really knew about blockchain and not, um, it was not something that you can take a class on. So I found myself, you know, recognizing this this gap between academia and and blockchain and i decided to fill that gap by starting this club and it grew to over 100 students and got faculty involved from all these different departments from computer science to econ to finance um to come together and and you know bridge this gap and then um you know it grew on from there we connected with a global blockchain campus started working with University of Berkeley and universities all across the globe to bridge this gap and start creating educational content, started hosting workshops to educate, um, you know, the public and specifically the people around me at the time in my own university. And, you know, the need actually came from trying to start my own company in blockchain. And I realized, you know, there was a big talent shortage. People didn't even know what blockchain was. So hiring blockchain developers was a big challenge for me. And so this, you know, blockchain and Mason was sort of a pipeline to bridge that talent gap as well. And um, that sort of started my journey. And, you know, I learned a lot from my startup. It did not become successful. But when you get burned, that's when you learn the biggest lessons in life. And then I went on to work 
at the intersection of blockchain and government, starting off at uh, Lidos as, as, as their first blockchain engineer and building applications for um, defense, space, healthcare use cases using blockchain and all my learnings from teaching uh, blockchain itself. Um, and also another fun fact was I was teaching how to create games uh, to little students uh, and I would say high schoolers and incoming college students um, on how to develop on blockchain. They you know, taught them how to create voting applications on blockchain um, and specific games on blockchain. And I found it interesting how the younger generation picked up the concepts of blockchain and decentralization a lot quicker than any adult. And so that's when I realized, you know, um, anybody over the age of 30 to 40, they have a really tough time grasping the paradigm shift. And it is a different model, mental model and a different way of thinking. And, you know, the younger generation will be the ones that will drive this change forward. And, you know, fast forward now, it's almost a decade of me being in this industry and trying to bring in real world use cases by bringing this to the government and making sure the government can adopt this. Because as you mentioned, uh, the public goods, right? Government is the biggest provider of public goods. And so imagine a government that can be trusted and transparent and be held accountable with its decisions because they're leveraging the blockchain. So that's been one of my biggest drivers of me still staying in the DC area and working with the decision makers and folks at the highest levels to make sure we adopt blockchain so we can have a trusted government and we can bring that trust back to the citizens because I know that trust is a very big thing and it is deteriorating as we speak from, you know, data. And now with the rise of AI, it is very hard to trust. And so for me, it's very important to fight this good fight and make sure we bring and, and, somebody has to bring this adoption to the government because I want to see a government that is operating under transparency and accountability. Yeah, that's an incredible journey, starting all the way from the dark web into the government. That, that's an interesting um, uh, story arc. I um, mean, also, yeah, some very, very similar um, to, to how um, I first became aware of blockchain as well, except didn't end up at the government. So yeah, it's a, a little a little bit of, the, the splits, but that's incredible going from there. And actually, you know, from the blockchain university perspective, seeing all these interdisciplinary fields come together, as well as um, just seeing a bunch of different use cases that are really underlooked now from gaming to democracy, a lot of things that haven't actually reached mass adoption, you were already educating people back then. Um, and so now you are the manager of emerging technology at CGI, one of the largest government consulting groups um what would you say you've learned like from trying experimenting with a lot of different things in the web3 space and then actually trying to apply it on the public sector on the enterprise level like what are, what are your biggest pain points and your lessons from the application perspective Oh, so the biggest pain point was, you know, education and, and making folks realize what the value of blockchain is. You know, there was a time as I was developing out, out these products, um, when you have a hammer, you might have heard this thing, when you have a hammer, everything can look like a nail. So blockchain, you know, was seen as a magical thing that could be applied to any use case. And that is where I saw the enterprise in the blockchain world going wrong is that they all wanted to create their own private blockchains and for specific use cases that had nothing to do with really solving the core problem, which was data sharing or data visibility or data integrity. And, you know, I had a very different take. Um, and, and funny enough, every time I interviewed at these large companies um, to get a role in blockchain, I always disagreed with their approach and I still got the job. And where I disagreed on was the fact that they all wanted to create their own private blockchain. And let's think about that for a second. Blockchain means a decentralized database, right? right? So now we're talking about private blockchain. Really, you're talking about a centralized, decentralized database. To me, it doesn't make sense. It still doesn't make sense. But I basically had the mindset of, look, I will still build it. You can still pay me to build it. We can experiment with it. But I had this notion of a hybrid blockchain where you have privacy, but the blockchain inherently is still decentralized. 
So imagine this perfect balance of privacy and transparency and decentralization. And, and so I had a very unique perspective that I brought to the industry. And as you can tell, most private blockchain implementations has failed to this date. Even Walmart, IBM, they started it. They're shutting it down. Um, EY has experimented with it heavily. Lidos, where I worked, we also experimented with heavily. You know, we proved out certain concepts and we also proved out the intersection of blockchain and IoT and AI, where we had built solutions around a supply chain use case where, you know, you had specific sensors spent uh, sending data being picked up by an AI and then put on chain. And now we all had visibility on where things are. Now that that worked theoretically from a proof of concept perspective, but the biggest challenge was how do you take it from a proof of concept prototype to actual production? And that is where that is where we stop. You know, a lot of these initiatives never made it to production. They never made it past the proof of concepts. So now my biggest goal is how do I bring a solution that I know can be adopted and used in pro in production, not just something that you create in a lab and it just stays there. So, you know, that has been the biggest challenge is making folks, number one, understand what the value proposition of blockchain really is. And then number two, how do you build it the right way? Because the strategic approaches was not right. And, and people were still approaching it from a very web two perspective, where you're still centralizing a decentralized system. So for me, how do you align the incentives of everyone in the government to come together and then I realized, you know, this actually has to happen from a policy perspective. It cannot happen through one company. It cannot happen through one contract. It actually has to happen from a government-wide policy adoption where everyone is now incentivized to adopt a blockchain system that is sufficiently decentralized because we don't want to create the same problem again, which is a network of networks that don't necessarily talk to each other. And that's been the biggest problem within the government. And part of the reason why something like 9-11 happened in the first place, right? Because governments and agencies knew something bad was going to happen, but they were not incentivized to share that data and share it quickly enough. So I think blockchain really serves as that ledger where you can incentivize the government and hold folks accountable for not making the decisions fast enough. because. I think, you know, blockchain can be used as a tool to solve and protect against against issues like that happening and disasters like that happening. So, you know, number one, education, number two, the strategic uh, implementation to production, and then three, implementing it from a policy perspective with aligned incentives. Those are some of the big points that I've seen in my last decade of trying to bring blockchain to the government. Yeah, no, that's an incredible perspective. There's a few threads I want to pull on on that perspective. I mean, firstly, in, in terms of you had the startup perspective and then you had the government perspective, the agile three to five person teams that ship straight to production. And then you have the government with like the waterfall method and taking a long time to iterate. Um, but then also a compromise between um, the two now that from launching a private blockchain where you have these kind of permission nodes launching a public blockchain in itself is a very difficult feat. So I, I kind of want to pick your brain on like, what, what are, are you bringing these kind of new agile software engineering methodologies to the government? How, how does that happen? Like in terms of like the day-to-day -day operations of, of shipping this code? Oh, no, absolutely. So, you know, you think that the government, you know, is, is waterfall, but now, Everything that we do is agile, and it's been that way for the last several years. Um, the government has shifted from this waterfall method to this agile method. So everything that, um, at least personally, with my teams, we've been moving in a very agile way. And to be honest, it actually feels like a startup where you know I have a team of four or five engineers building out this prototype. We're creating a demo and then going out and engaging with the customer within the government and showing them, hey, look, this is the value. Um, that you can get out of this, out of adopting this. And we've had some success with that approach. So I think taking, you know, having a lean team that really understands Web3 from not just a code perspective, but also the UI, UX, and the design. I think that was a massive um, leap. You know, how do you abstract wallets? How do you abstract transactions? 
So having to do those things on the back end and also make sure the UI UX and taking a, you know, a human centered design approach, following the agile methodology. And that's something that I've done, you know, at Lido's and I'm also now doing at CGI and I've had really good successes in terms of creating these proof of concepts, getting to a demo, creating a product that is then, you know, being demoed out to a bunch of customers and they're not only just learning about it, but they're seeing the value of Web3 and what it means to have a human-centered design approach to Web3 applications. And as like you said, um, Agile right now is the way to go because of the speed of change that we are seeing in this industry. Um, you can't you know, have one mindset and just adopt one way with you know, being very picky or stubborn about one specific blockchain or one specific tech stack. You have to keep an open mind and still be flexible enough to adopt to specific new technologies. So, you know, one of the approaches that I've taken is building with modular architectures. Everything should be plug and play. Everything should be flexible. Nothing should be in a monolithic way. And you should be able to adapt as technology changes, as needs changes. Um, you have to be able to adapt. And that all falls down, you know, with the agile methodology uh, and, and moving fast with a small team instead of having a big, huge team that moves very slow, you know, and, and usually that's only with um, products that's already established, already in production. So that is the cool part about being in a large company, but in an innovation sort of lab where you get to move fast like a startup. And I actually like to compare it like a SEAL, SEAL Team 6 type of um, approach where, you know, we are very specialized at one skill and building a thing. And so imagine bringing in a small team of five to six people to build that very special need that nobody in the company can build but your team. So it's, it's, been, it's been great to have the backing of a large company, but operate like a startup. Yeah, and then go, going kind of off of that, there's a lot that startups need to kind of make compromises with, especially when developing a whole stack, especially when deciding for a public blockchain, I kind of wanted to pick into that. You mentioned different primitives like meta transaction or like paymasters and account abstraction and even identity and, and privacy on there. And there has been kind of this new meta, especially to, to launch a L2 or even to launch a new generation blockchain. Although it's not a private blockchain, it is a public blockchain. All those primitives are needed to be built. So how do you kind of like look at it from like if you have the resources of you know a, a multi tens of thousand people company like why not build a blockchain or versus using an existing blockchain and what are kind of the primitives that you really look for uh, to making this happen yeah no i think that's a that's a great question right um because when you're a large organization you so, you sort of tend to think that you have the firepower to go build something on your own which is certainly true um, but we looked at the whole landscape and then asked this question, and this is a question I like to ask myself is, can we hire a team of 10 to 20 engineers that can compete against the open source and open source developers like in Ethereum or Cosmos or Polygon? And the quick answer is no. It does not matter how many smart engineers we bring on board, you know, a team of 10, it will be very difficult to compete against the open source world. And, you know, as you know, open source is eating the world. Even Google engineers are now worried that they are not moving fast enough in their verticals compared to how fast open source moves. So, you know, the mindset that in the perspective I look at it from is, you know, can you compete against Linux by building your own Linux, right? Blockchain to me is almost like its own operating system. And so if you have an internal company and you're trying to build your own operating system, it, it will take a lot more effort than you first initially realize right and guess what in within cgi the first two years before i arrived we did exactly that you know there was a team of six engineers building out their own private blockchain writing out the read writes and all the crud operations from scratch and then when i came in i looked at it i was you know and, and the first thought i had was why are we building these things up from scratch because you don't realize the the fundamental blocks you sort of have to rebuild it um, if you're trying to build it for the government and, and build it in different ways. And can that compete against open source? You know, within two years, by the time they were done, 
the world has already moved on. Ethereum and Hyperledger Fabric and these these specific components um, already were way ahead. And so now how do you catch up to that? And you also have to worry about talent, right? What if some of your smartest engineers leave after two years? As you know, a, a person stays at a company for no more than two years on average. So now the core engineers that have built this private blockchain with their documentation now left, it is very hard to bring on new talent and onboard them and make them understand how they built it from scratch. So with that perspective, I think that is the reason why um, private blockchain implementations have failed because by the time you finish and now you have to go public, right, from a private blockchain, it's very hard to make it public because you built things in a certain way. You had certain engineers, you know, have specific proprietary knowledge that is not easily transferable. So that is why, in my opinion, open source always wins. And so if now with that perspective, you know, I had to rebuild everything from scratch. And then I, then I realized, asked myself this question, do I do the same thing? Do I repeat history? Do I rebuild exactly what they rebuilt, but from scratch with my own new team now rebuilding a private blockchain? And to me, that didn't make sense. And that is where I started adopting um, Ernest and Young's EY's perspective of really betting on private, betting on privacy technology on public chains. Because blockchain, the decentralized ledger already exists. Bitcoin is the best one. There's Ethereum, there's Polygon, and these layer twos. So leave the decentralization and the public to the public. And how do we build privacy technology on top of that, on top of the public chain. And so that is where I, I started having a very different perspective on an approach to bringing this to the government. Because for me, you know, the only way I would say a, a government blockchain would work is, as I mentioned before, through policy. If there was a mandate to say every government agency needs to adopt blockchain and we have our own U.S. government blockchain, and every agency is running their own node, that is the only way I can see a private, public, or semi-hybrid blockchain being used within the government. So now the perspective that I'm taking is, you know, with the advancements in zero knowledge and uh, fully homomorphic encryption, you can now add privacy to your public blockchain smart contracts. So um, there are things like um, from the team of uh, Zama, who's built out um, holy, fully homomorphic encryption and encrypted and confidential smart contracts. Now you can actually have fully encrypted variables onto smart contracts where you can hide token balances, you can hide certain um, you know, variables. Now, to me, we are at an inflection point where this actually makes sense. The vision that I've had of privacy on top of public chains is now here and the adoption of it will also come soon and, and will soon follow. And, um, you know, that, that is a different approach that I've had for the last five years, but the technology just was not there, right? The technology was not caught up, but now it is. And I'm seeing a lot of layer twos adopting, um, you know, FHE, fully homomorphic encryption into their networks. And I've seen actually uh, two or three other layer twos or layer ones actually building on top of uh, Zama and their team on building these privacy preserving blockchains that are public, but can hide certain elements. And to be honest, that is, that is the reason why, you know, government and enterprise want, want to launch private blockchains because they want privacy. Without that privacy, you will never see adoption at the government level. Now, if you can guarantee that privacy with these encryption schemes like zero knowledge and FHE, then I know for a fact they are a lot more uh, receptive to adopting it. Yeah, and, and having those primitives available, like again, this wasn't a reality up until like recently, recently. Even Solana with their new token standard, they've they've implemented private transactions actually for the balances as, as well. I don't think they use FHE, but this is something that They've been in the works for years. And even I remember over a year ago seeing Azama's pitch deck and uh, and hearing first about FHE. And it yeah, it was it was even all these like real use zero knowledge applications. Like we have 
for our identity solution, you know, powered by Holonym, government ID, and to be able to verify your phone number. And all these primitives are coming together. But personally, I'm still kind of uh, skeptical. There is there is now, you know, ZK Sync, I think with uh, Clave or Clave or whatever you call it, they have a really good onboarding and, you know, wallet experience and a paymaster's experience as well. But from my perspective, especially when we first started using Polygon years ago, that was a fraction of a fraction of a cent. And all these layer twos, even with the new uh, Denku upgrade, it's still a couple of cents. So yes, there is a bunch of primitive building blocks in there, but do you truly believe, given the current technologies, that it is ready to scale for microtransactions and for uh, everyday use? Like, wh How are you looking at that and what the applications that you can actually reasonably build on? I think that is a great question because, you know, when we say privacy preserving primitives, right, um, how do we really know that they're secure? And and I think it's not even, you know, scalability, I think will come, but I, I think we need to convince that the security is up to par with what the claims are. And one of the biggest gaps that I'm seeing is uh, privacy preserving definitions and benchmarks for these new primitives. I, I don't think I've seen a anybody come up with definitions and benchmarks for what does it mean to really be secure with zero knowledge? What does it mean to really be secure with um, FHE, right? We just throw these words around, but how are we really testing these, these cryptographic primitives? And the concern with any new primitive is, you know, you have all the hype of new technology. You have everybody in a bandwagon adopting this, but but you have to look at the other side and from a security uh, perspective, because that's number one you know, imperative and priority for the government is security, not necessarily scalability. Government does not really care about scaling as much, but they do care about security. So for me, it's not even about transaction cost scalability. Government spends hundreds of millions and billions of dollars actually on inefficient solutions that don't necessarily scale, but they are very, very secure. So for me, we need to fill the cryptographic uh, primitives definitions and this gap of not having benchmark tools. And in fact, that is why um, I started uh, Labs DAO and, and the specific collective of a decentralized community that can help come up and shape these definitions. And so that is actually one of the um, grants that we are seeking from NSF to specifically focus and do research on these cryptographic primitive definitions. Yeah, and that's also been working with different people implementing ZK on their application level. We can't even find auditors. There's maybe Zokio and Zelic, but there is, there, there's only a few in the game that even advertise that they audit ZK proofs, not even FHE. And then coming into that intersectionality, there's only a few of those people that even have the security clearance to be working with the government. So that that in itself is a huge feat. You talked about, you know, regulatory and policy or more policy, uh, policy than regulatory. And then you just mentioned you were founding a DAO. So looking at the current regulatory landscape, like how, why are you forming a DAO versus just a traditional government consulting firm? I think that's a great question for me. You know, um, innovation is tradition and, and what better way to show innovation than live it and breathe it and actually execute it. So for me, uh, my, my thesis is that DAOs will be the fundamental way the, the, the companies of the future will operate. And if that is my thesis, then what better way to learn and test that thesis than to start one yourself? And that is where, you know, I started evaluating the landscape and how can I run a DAO within the U.S., within the confines of the regulatory limitations? And that is why, where I, I ended up deciding to launch this DAO under um, the law, on the, under the state of Wyoming, because they have the, the most, I would say, robust DAO LLC um, laws. And so, you know, for me, if I can prove this out through this DAO, I think this will start. This will serve as a standard for the U.S. government. If I can show that I am running a company under, you know, hyper transparency and accountability, and I'm running my operations, I'm running my invoicing, I'm running my decision making through this DAO, 
on chain that is completely auditable and verifiable. And that is exactly what the government expects from the private industry. Well, we can flip the switch and say, look, we are now serving as that standard of a DAO operating and working with the U.S. government. And now you can see this DAO as a standard for the government itself operating as a DAO. And this is a very way out there vision that I have. And anybody I shared it with calls me crazy. But that's exactly how I know that I'm on the right track. Because if I wasn't called crazy for mentioning and having this vision, then I know I was in the wrong path and I'm not dreaming big enough. And so my vision is, you know, how can I make the United States, I want to make the United States of DAOs. Imagine every agency, every state, to me, actually, the United States is the most decentralized country comprised of 50 states coming together to make a decision. So for me, decentralization is the solution for a lot of our problems in the sense of we have the most resiliency, right? If you are decentralized, if one or two or three nodes fail, you are still resilient. So that's why the United States to me is the most resilient country because we are comprised of 50 states. Now, you extrapolate this into a DAO concept, a decentralized autonomous organization, extrapolate this from an organization to a country level. What does a decentralized autonomous country look like? And that is where, you know, I live in the future and, you know, be me being in in the position that I'm in, at, you know, in my role in emerging technology, I always have to be thinking about the future. What does the next 5, 10, 20 years look like? And for me, my 20, my 10 to 20 year vision is the United States government running as a, and operating as a DAO. And so if that is my vision, I had to take a step back. And now at a ground level, what can I do today to set that standard up? And that is what led me to start Labs DAO to serve as a standard operating model for the government, starting off with working with the government and then eventually bringing it to the government and adopting that standard across, across the United States and eventually the globe. Yeah, that's an incredibly bold vision. There is a lot you know, to do and a lot to even consider when first kind of creating a DAO. I've been involved in a lot of like DAO tooling and like even ran the, the near DAO builder groups for a while and I'm part of DAOs, honestly, in a bunch of uh, jurisdictions as well. And so how do you look at it from a, a building perspective? Like we talked like before about building your own blockchain, there's a lot of building a lot of DAO primitives and essentially how we like to describe DAOs is a business on chain. And every business needs, like you said, operating and invoices. They need some type of identity and membership. They need some type of onboarding. Um, and so how did you begin to look at this landscape and where do you kind of find yourself building new things versus all using already existing tools? Yeah, I mean, it, it started off looking at the whole DAO landscape and I've been following this DAO landscape for the last three years. And so seeing it evolve and seeing the tools come together now, I would say, you know, we have the DAO stack, what I call the DAO stack. When you, when you launch a company, you have to figure out what is your communication tool? What is your accounting tool? What is your invoicing tool, right? And I've seen this uh, DAO stack sort of mature to a point where I now don't necessarily have to build uh, any DAO primitives per se, but rather integrate with, the ex with these existing tools, these DAO tools that have come about. Like, um, for example, you know, leveraging um, tokens, leveraging uh, Snapshot, Collabland, and bringing it together and just experimenting with it. And then also, like, if it doesn't work, we can easily switch to something else. And so having that flexibility within the DAO stack, you know, the, the word modularity, I'm going to say this again, the DAO stack also has to be modular. How can you move from one application or dApp to another. And that is something that is also very important um, to the DAO members. And so, you know, I don't necessarily make the decision myself. This is not a, you know, a dictatorship, but rather a collective decision amongst the DAO members to pick the tools that they're familiar with that they want to integrate with. And so we collect collectively make that decision um, to come together. And so, you know, the, it just starts with uh, testing and trials. So for example, um, Two weeks ago was when we had the first DAO 
uh, transaction for invoicing where we paid out a specific um, DAO member through request.finance. And so we're, you know, that was one of the tools after evaluating three or four, we just decided to go with that because it had the most, um, uh, most uh, usage and it's been around the longest. So that's the other thing that we're evaluating is just because a, a tool is new does not mean that we are going to use it. We're going to test it out, evaluate it, but usually it's, you know, what, which, which of these tools have a track record, which of these tools have been used by other DAOs successfully. And then we make that decision based on the history of that tool being used. Because as you know, a lot of these protocols, a lot of these companies, you start and you then adopt it, and then the company can go out of business. So once it goes out of business, what do you do? And so you have to have a lot, a lot of factors play in into your DAO stack. You do not want to pick something new and shiny. And then next thing you know, you're so tied to it that if they go out of business, you are also at risk. So it's about choosing, even within this new emerging field, some of the tools that already have a track record of operating for several years now. And that's sort of what, how we're deciding and what we're leveraging within our own DAO stack. Yeah, and we've had that, you know, our underlying infrastructure get rugged on us before. It's it's really hard when you're building a startup on top of other startups. And um, j just just a little bit of background context, though, like based on the tools you're using, um, it seems like it's obviously on Ethereum. You have Collabland, which lets you, you know, easily have badges on your Discord, on your roles. You have Snapshot, which lets you build a whole gasless, composable, um, you know, governance framework uh, on top of your ENS. Um, request finance, it's a whole financial stack, you know, people use it generally for invoicing, and they even have their own, you know, grant system and easy, easy way to, to integrate. So I think building with this composability in mind is very, is very key and very essential, like kind of like Uniswap hooks. I think, like you said, like snapshot does a really good job at that. This is how we're thinking with our funding stack, how if you know, if this contract gets compromised, or if no one can no longer maintain it, how do we have like on chain version controlling? How do we have it so people can plug in different registries, different identities, uh, different distribution mechanisms, different engagement systems. So yeah, that's, that's something I think a lot of people like you want to build an MVP when you're when you're launching something, but at the same time, people often comp like compromise this composability, and then it results in them creating everything from scratch. So it's great to hear that not only with creating a public blockchain, but also creating a public DAO, a lot of these prim primitive now are here um, that are easy to plug into. And so another thing I wanted to 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 ask about is like you mentioned, you mentioned you're, you're like at CGI you're in not the blockchain space like you were at Lidos, but you're in emerging tech. Um, and so can you kind of differentiate like your definitions of blockchain, Web3 and emerging tech and how that overlaps? Sure. So, you know, when I when I joined uh, when, at Lidos, I was, you know, hired as a blockchain engineer. And when I came on to um, CGI, I was also hired as a blockchain engineer. And what we started to see is this massive shift to what the word Web3. And at the time, you know, I started pushing towards that narrative of, hey, you know, blockchain is a lot more than just underlying tech. So for me, blockchain was a umbrella, you know, Web3 is an umbrella term that encompasses blockchain. So blockchain is a small little component within Web3. And so the definition of Web3 today, is still not defined by anybody, right? But I tend to follow the definition of Coinbase as one of the most trusted Web3 blockchain companies within the United States operating under the regulatory bodies of the U.S. government, you know, I think their Web3 definition uh, and the metaverse definition of, of, of Coinbase really resonated with me personally. And that is where I started pushing that vision of Web3 within CGI and I got a lot of backlash, I'll be honest. At first, folks were like, what is Web3? This is such a new thing. Nobody within the government is asking for this. So why should we adopt this term Web3 rather than blockchain? So for me, it was, how do I, how do I get, the, get this company and the enterprise to realize it, there's more than blockchain? There's a lot more here. It's not about just a ledger. We had digital identities being put on top of this ledger. We had zero knowledge coming on top of this ledger. Um, we had all these other cool innovations that necessarily did, 
was not captured by the word blockchain, right? So for me, push towards Web3 was to bring in digital identity that is anchored on a blockchain. So, and, you know, those conversations eventually started getting accepted. So at first, I really was told, get the word Web3 out of, out of my mouth. And now I have executives using the word Web3 to describe it as a revolutionary technology where AI is an evolutionary technology. And so, you know, for me, it was incrementally diversifying my skill sets from blockchain to other areas like digital identity, like zero knowledge, like homomorphic encryption, which is not just blockchain, it is way more than blockchain. So from Web3, now I'm finding myself looking at the intersection with AI and privacy technologies, such as homomorphic encryption and zero knowledge. And that is how I got my role as I've evolved out of blockchain into more categories and looking at the intersectionalities of these technologies. So, you know, looking at from the perspective of using blockchain to bring transparency and auditability into AI, as you know, AI is a black box. So that is where I had to upskill myself in AI with the explosion. So now my brand and, and really what I focus on in my team is applied research in three specific areas, blockchain, AI, and privacy technologies. And so anytime any of these topics come um, within any RFI, RFP, and anybody within the government that's looking for anything with blockchain, AI, and privacy tech, or this intersection that comes to me and my team, and I specifically help respond and come up with solutions and develop prototypes at this intersection. Because to me, it's not just the isolated technology, but the convergence of these technologies with other tech that is also emerging that you can really find interesting use cases and unlock value that you have not seen before. So that is how I got my title of being a manager within the emerging technology uh, practice. And specifically within that, the applied research division, because now I'm having to read research papers, you know, take away ideas that are way far out there that are not necessarily proven yet as five, maybe 10 years out and, and make it a reality and bring it, bring it home and start creating proof of concepts and prototypes. So it's been an amazing journey because now, for me, my job is a lot more interesting because I'm not looking at it from one dimension, one perspective of just blockchain and Web3, but I'm looking at it from an AI perspective. I'm looking from privacy perspective and making sure we can, you know, I can provide as much value as I can to my clients and my customers, you know, being the U.S. government. And so I think that is part of um, upskilling. As you know, uh, with AI coming really, we start questioning our own value. How can we provide value if an AI can do my job? So for me, it's it's upskilling myself and looking at the convergence and connecting dots. And so for me, I'm a dot connector between these emerging techs. And that is why, you know, I'm no longer just a blockchain guy now. I'm also a blockchain, AI, and privacy guy. Sometimes even IoT, you know, sensors and and and, and specific machines leveraging blockchain and AI. So it makes it makes it's it's made my job very interesting to say the least yeah and, and you and you picked on a few threads throughout this interview so you mentioned iot it's been a long time since we were researching about iota and dags and i think this even got rebranded to dpin decentralized physical infrastructure network which is an incredible pivot um but to me that was the iot the web3 iot of things you mentioned even stuff in space and now there's an emerging field called d space with like Moon DAO sending people to the moon, even Lockheed Martin's involved. You mentioned confederated DAOs across the United States. There's this concept that Balaji is really putting forward with network states. And, and even in here in, in, uh, in, in Austin, we're about to do a network state event. There's ATX DAO. There's even a DC DAO forming. There's Zuzalu with these pop-up cities. So how are you looking at these, these kind of far out different trends? And then in, in the, because in, they're not just these three identity um, and uh, uh, things that you mentioned, but there, there are these whole new concepts and fields. So how are you paying attention to, to that? No, I think that's a, that's a great point. And, you know, as you mentioned, um, all these sort of emerging trends are sort of coming together in my mind, deep in 
uh, is sort of being rebranded from, you know, IoT and then um, the idea of network states and specific DAOs forming for specific use cases. Um, so I'm keeping my, my eye out on all of them. But, you know, sort of right now, I have to basically focus and have a have a brand that is focusing on the intersections of these specific things. So I'm I'm sort of looking at the convergence of using these technologies as a building block to affect specific industries. So imagine the combination of blockchain and AI being used in space, that fundamental technology can also be used on earth, on the ground for supply chain and visibility tracking when combined with IoT. So that is why you know the umbrella term of emerging technology is so valuable to me because now you can't just say one or two or three things. You have to really look at the whole landscape and have an open mind about, you know, the technologies that are coming together in convergence. But for me, you know, all of these things are super exciting, but what really stands out is the intersection of blockchain and AI. I think that convergence of those two technologies are, is, is so disruptive that I don't think we as a society have articulated the true value that could be unlocked from the conversion of just those two things. Um, of course, now you combine it with machines, autonomous robots, um, you now enter a, a whole different realm. But I think there has to be a technology adoption curve one step at a time. You can't necessarily boil the whole ocean, right? You have to have a certain focus. So that's why within my emerging tech umbrella, I'm specifically focusing on a few things I would say is, of course, DAOs collaborating using the blockchain, but the conversions of AI. And um, that is where, you know, uh, Labs DAO actually uh, open sourced a public go goods tool called Anacostia Blockchain, which specifically allows you to do machine learning operations on chain. And that is truly to unlock um, the AI black box. How do you audit AI and its decision making and its bias? using blockchain and also um, IP, protection of your IP as you experiment with AI. Um, so that is an area that I'm really focused on and I, I would like to invite you know the community and anybody that's listening to really um, you know look at that tool and how you can leverage it. And um, this is something that the DAO is also trying to um, bring on to big organizations and government agencies because it really is is a public good we're not trying to, you know, necessarily make money out of this protocol. Eventually, we want to turn this into a protocol. But the biggest thing is adoption and experimentation and feedback on the implications of what we've built. And we're open sourcing out to the community. And um, that's what we did at Eat Denver. We, um, you know, built this proof of concept of ML Ops on chain. And we put this out to the world um, and in hopes of getting adoption and feedback and and just have thought provoking questions on what ca what else can we do uh, but you know going back it's uh, emerging tech i'm no longer just a blockchain focused person i'm just looking at the whole um world and society and looking at what emerging tech will disrupt uh the way we live but also what what emerging technologies provide us the most value and so you know the rapid change of of innovation you really have to keep an open mind. You cannot become a maximalist in in one thing or other. Um, you know, I, I, I like to have a saying that you can be stubborn with your vision that I've laid out for myself in the next 10 to 20 years, but you have to be flexible in the details and the process on how you get there. So for me, I'm very stubborn on the vision that I have for the governments of the world and enterprises, how they should function in the next 10 to 20 years. But I'm very flexible on the details and the process. So it could be a combination of blockchain, AI, IoT, DPIN, whatever word or narrative you want to put out there. But having that flexibility is super important because, you know, you'd rather be on the right side of history than wrong. And, um, you know, I plan on being right because, you know, I, I have been right with a lot of my predictions. And um, so that's the reason why, you know, I'm very stubborn on the vision, but flexible on the details and the technology. Yeah, that's 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 in, that's incredible, and I think it's incredible to see even on on the public goods note, like that as a you know 
private classified working on technology, you guys are very dependent on the open source technology that people are building. And then now you're forming an open process and open coordination tool using a lot of these building blocks to build open source software in itself. And 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 that's a beautiful thing. I know people at Open Source Observer and Drips Network and Gigpoint who track this are trying to quantify that value of how enterprises are impacted by open source software. And for for those who you know, want to get involved in labs that were the work that you're doing. You mentioned the repo. What is the major call to action? Is this, and you know, you mentioned a DAO of DAOs. I've, I've worked in a lot of DAO of DAOs and DAOs. Is this something that is porous and individual contributors can get into? Is this something that product labs and different researchers kind of join? Like how, how do you get involved uh, with labs DAO and, and who are you looking for? Yeah, I'm truly looking for uh, partners um, in in the vision that I've shared, right? So like I said, I'm flexible on the details, but stubborn on the vision. So if you share that vision that I've put laid out of, you know, having a world that is operating under hyper transparency and hyper accountability, I invite anybody to join and connect with me personally, first of all. And then second of all, you can follow LabsDAO um, on GitHub. And there's a there's a LabsDAO organization. Look at the repo and download the repo, fork it, start contributing there. Um, and then connect with me personally on LinkedIn or on Telegram, uh, SHA-256, or specifically LinkedIn, I would say, would be the would be the best way to connect with me. And, um, you know, I'm inviting anybody that is is sharing the vision, right, of a, a world where we are truly holding our governments accountable, but also can, we're bringing that trust back with the citizens of the world, trusting its government, trusting the data and just creating a better world and a better society. So you know, that would be my call to action is connect with me personally, follow LabsDAO, its accounts, um, and go to the GitHub. And uh, you know, we will be having a, a community call on March 29th with some of the LabsDAO members. And I'll also invite everybody to join that call. And the meeting, meeting details will be shared on LinkedIn um, for folks that want to contribute to learn about the architecture, about what we've built, how we built it, and where we're going in its future. And I would invite everybody um, to join that call as, as the initial DAO community kickoff call. And that will be March 29th. So I would say connect with me, um, follow me on LinkedIn, and you know keep, it, keep an eye out for those details. Yeah, and forking is one of the, the biggest forms of flattery in this game. So definitely, definitely get involved in, in the GitHub and LinkedIn. I'll share that in the show notes and yeah this has got me in- inspired you know i'm i i envision the world where the amount of taxes that we pay give us voting rights to how the budget is spent and if you oh, could do God. that <laughs> yeah, if I'm, you with, could... I'm with you and that, that that's part of my vision of me saying you know radical uh transparency and radical accountability and and I, i'm 100 percent with you imagine if we knew exactly where our tax money is going and us allocating that tax money on, on things that we care about. And that really is my vision for the future of, of the government, you know, 10 to 20 years from now. Um, and, and funny enough, I actually did a video with CGI um, this past week talking about government 2030. And that's also um, on YouTube now. I can share the link with you later on. But that's me talking about how I envision the government to look like in 2030, adopting blockchain and privacy tech and generative AI all combined to unlock various use cases to get that trust back. So this is something I'm pushing for professionally, outside of my work, you know, from my personal life. It's sort of all intertwined together to make this vision happen. Awesome, man. This is a beautiful vision. On a more positive note, do you have any words of inspiration for, you know, uh, uh, the younger versions of yourself that are getting into the game and getting into Web3 and just her government, and DID, and DAOs? Like, what, what, how would you recommend to, to keep that passion uh, to, the, to the younger audience? I would say dream big and, um, and look for no's. And one of the things that I have realized about me is you know, these no's will give you the resilience you need to become successful. And I think um, that if you face a bunch of no's, you are on the right track. Because my whole career, I've been facing no's. I've faced no's at George Mason when I wanted to start the blockchain club. I've faced no's in my startup. I've faced no's within the corporate world trying to bring blockchain Web3. And through the no's, eventually I got the yeses. So for me, 
you know, we as we as as anybody knew, we we're very afraid of failing. You know, what what would the what would the world say? What would society say if I fail? Um, but I've actually made my successes out of my failures. So don't be afraid of L's. Eventually, you stack your L's into W's. So that would be my my message to anybody coming in: is look forward to the pain, look forward to the L's, turn them into W's. Because I'm living proof of that. All right. Amazing, amazing session. Thank you so much for coming on, Shadman. And yeah, till next time, everybody. Thank you for having me.